One of the things I've really enjoyed about being the ALF podcast host is the opportunity to talk to tournament anglers about how they go about their fishing. And having never been a tournament angler myself, it's really interesting for me to see and hear what these guys and girls do to help themselves catch more fish and be more competitive. And despite not being a competitive angler, I really appreciate what the tournament scene does for fishing in Australia because all of these people are pushing the envelope. All of these people are testing new tackle, testing new techniques. And the stuff they're doing trickles back to, for want of a better word, the mainstream anglers, those who don't fish in tournaments like many of our ALF listers and myself. So I love that we have a tournament scene and I love what it brings to fishing, the completely different aspect it brings to fishing. But the other thing I love about the tournament scene is that it forces anglers to pack as much as they can into a small time frame, even if that time frame isn't ideal from a fishing perspective, even if the tides are wrong and the wind's wrong and everything else. For the duration of that comp, everybody who's participating and competing is trying to make the most out of every minute. And it occurs to me that that's kind of a really good way to approach life in general, isn't it? You don't know what's around the corner. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So if you're like me, you want to grab every window of opportunity. You want to get out and fish whenever you can. And that, you know, for many of us, we go through periods in our lives where we're busy with work, we're busy with family, we've got all kinds of other commitments, and those windows aren't always easy to grab. You know, when I was young, I had a lot more flexibility. I could choose the tides. I could choose the best time of year to go. I could plan trips around just going fishing. And sometimes I can still do that. But there's also plenty of times now where I'm just grateful to be able to grab any chance I can to get out and do some fishing. And I guess what I'm leading to in a long and rambling kind of a way is that for people who find themselves in that situation that their fishing opportunities are limited, they can either say, I'm going to take and appreciate every opportunity to get out on the water, even though I might you know, finish up with a donut, or they can take the tournament angler's approach and say, okay, This is when I'm going to fish. These are the conditions. How am I going to get the most out of this? Whichever way you go about it is fine, obviously. Fishing is a personal thing. It is to you what it is to you. And if it's enough just to hit the water and unwind, that's fantastic. Definitely go and do that. But if you're a bit more driven to catch fish and you have limited opportunity, then studying tournament anglers and seeing how they maximize the results and the emphasis they put on making the most out of every minute, not wasting any opportunity, that kind of never die wondering type approach. Well, let's just say that if we approached our fishing that way all the time, it might not be as relaxing, but we'd certainly catch more fish as social and recreational anglers if we adopted the techniques that tournament anglers use and we developed a tournament mindset. Now, today's guest is a tournament angler and he's a co-host on the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast. And luckily for all of us, he's only too happy to share some of the techniques and tips and tricks that he's learned from many years in the tournament scene so we can adopt and use them in our own fishing. And that's what today's conversation with Andrew Deeth is all about, just pulling some tips and tricks and things out of tournament fishing that can help everyday anglers to catch more fish recreationally and socially. Now, Deeth is a wonderful communicator. He's very, very open about sharing his knowledge. And he's also, for those who are very keen on their brim fishing, put together in the Team Doc Lures members area an awesome masterclass all about how to find and catch the bigger brim in a system, and obviously, you know, lots of small fish in a the system, they'll often get to your lure first. But Deethy's been exploring with a bunch of really, really good anglers how to find and target those bigger fish. So it's a must listen for tournament brim anglers. But again, if you're a recreational angler, you've got a big trophy brim, 50 centimeter fork or something like that on your bucket list, then you definitely want to go and listen to Deethy's masterclass. You can do that by supporting the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast and becoming part of Team Doc Lures. You won't just be supporting the podcast, you'll be slipping a few dollars in Deethy's direction as well. Not a lot of money, mind you, less than you'd pay for a cup of coffee once a week, but you'll get access to all the resources in the Team Doc Lures members area, including Deethy's Big Brim Masterclass, Luke Lisbeth's Kayak Masterclass, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So you can check that out over at Team Doc Lures, that's team, T-E-A-M dot doc lures dot com forward slash Deeth, D-E-A-T-H, I'll say that again, team dot doclures.com forward slash d-e-a-t-h go over there and check it out and i hope you, you know, become one of our newest members get to enjoy those audio masterclasses get to enjoy the tools and things that we've put up on the team doc Lures members area to help anglers and as well of course the tackle deals that we've got available to members over at team doc Lures too 
And folks, there's just one other thing you need to know as well before we launch into this podcast episode, and that is that Deethy has his own podcast, The Brim Fishing Project, where he's doing exactly what he's doing here today with me. He's interviewing some of Australia's best tournament anglers and breaking down their strategy and breaking down what worked for them on those days when they've had a red letter day and finished up on the podium. So if you love brim fishing, you absolutely want to go and check out the Brim Fishing Project. You'll find it on all the usual podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, all of those. But I'll also make it really easy for you and I'll put a link in the show notes of today's episode. So go and check that out, the Brim Fishing Project with Andrew Deeth. Okay, anyway, time that we get Deethy on the microphone and we get today's episode underway. I'm really keen to extract some great fishing tips from him. So here we go with episode 620. This is the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast, where our mission is to help everyday sports fishers experience extraordinary lure fishing. If next level fishing is your dream, then let us provide the tools and information that will bring that dream to life. Tune in as our expert hosts chat with Australia's best anglers and share their tips for success. Then check out our website. It's one of Australia's largest and most popular online fishing resources. But right now, settle in to listen as ALF founder Greg Doc Lures Vinyl delivers today's episode through the nerdy lens of a scientist, lure maker, and sport fishing tragic. Hey, hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast. Going to have a great session today because we have thrown the script out the window. I've got the old mate here, Deethy, on the other end of the uh, on the other end of the microphone. How you going, Deethy? Oh, mate, I'm pretty good. How are you? Yeah, good, 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 mate. Really, really excited to be having a chat today. We're going to pick apart a bit of your tournament strategy, mate, and maybe talk about how non-tournament fishers might be able to use some of the stuff that you do that puts you on the podium. Well, yeah, mate, that's going to be really interesting. I've had some interesting results over the last couple of months, as, you, as you're aware. <laughs> I had a big win and had, and had a big loss, so we'll, we'll see what happens, eh? Well, let's focus on the winning strategy, mate. That's what we're going to pin this particular episode on. And as I said, the script's gone out the window. So this could go the same way as your fishing tournament, mate. It could go well, could go very, very badly. We'll just have to wait and see how it, uh, how it pans out. Oh, mate, I'm sure, I'm sure we've got something for people to listen to. I'm sure it'll work out just <laughs> fine. Oh, you're full of so much useful information. It'd be just about impossible not to. So let's start by talking about those recent tournament results. And I think it's really good that you've mentioned that they haven't all been glowing, right? Because I think it's really easy for people who, you know, maybe aren't involved in tournaments. They're sitting at home, they're watching the social media, they see guys like yourself and a lot of the other tournament guys, and they see all these photos of fish coming up, whether it's brim or whether it's some other species, cod or dewies or whatever it might be. And they think, geez, this guy's just creaming them every single time. But it's not like that, is it? It's not like that at all. I was actually, um, I was talking to Steve Morgan about it. So anyone who's in the brim scene, he, the across Steve Morgan, now he does, he goes out and films his entire comp day, and uh, which is like six, seven hours worth of fishing. And he'll condense that down into somewhere between, say, 10 and 17 minutes. And it looks like he's just brained him. And he, he has, he's a champion fisherman, but it's the highlights reel. It's not the day. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's really, you, you got to take that into account when you're watching stuff on social media. Yeah. Yeah. And look, you know, I was talking to, as you probably heard, Tristan Sloan the other day about fishing for Dewey's up around Ballina, you know, and You'll see Tristan, he's, he's holding up photos of big deweys all the time. And he, he says, oh, well, you know, it's about one in every 10 trips, maybe I get one of those really big fish and I get, you know, school-sized fish much more consistently. But you know, it's one in every 10 trips, but you don't see that looking at social media, right? So Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the trap. You know, people think that everyone's out there slaying them and, it, and sometimes that's the case, but it, it, often it's not. It's just the highlights reel. Now, I do have to say, though, I think in Morgo's case, part of the problem is that the brim is starting to know him, mate. I think he's he's caught most of the brim in Australia at least once each. And so he's got to go somewhere where the fish don't know him. Oh, exactly, mate. He, he's definitely been around. He knows how to catch them on, on like most systems. The men's, like if you go and talk to him, he's an encyclopedia about systems. So, oh, yeah. He knows more about brim than what the brim do. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> anyway, we're not talking about Morgo, mate. We're talking about you. So, Tell us about these recent results. Tell us the good, tell us the bad, tell us the ugly. Okay. All right. Well, we'll start with Bem River. So anyone that follows my podcast, The Brim Fishing Project, 
they will be aware that, that we had a big round down in Bem River a couple of months back. Anyway, I promoted this round massively and we ended up with a bunch of people there and it was a really fun event. But what was even more fun is that I won the event. So after promoting it really hard, it was just an interesting thing. But look, on this day, on the two days of the competition, it was one of those comps where I kind of, just everything worked. Like I didn't lose any big fish, I caught fish consistently through the days and then I come up with the big, big win. And then we flipped that. We go a month later and we went up to Woi Woi. I had a pre-fish up there, caught no brim on the pre-fish. And then comp day, you heard it, a donut. <laughs> First day, and I haven't. I can't. I have to look back and find out when I had my last donut because I haven't had it. So for anyone that doesn't know, that's zero fish. Hmm. And then on day two, I caught one fish. So it wasn't a double donut, but it it was pretty ordinary. So, so yeah, this is this is a cricket equivalent of getting a test match century one day and then getting a duck the next sort of stuff. Absolutely, and nobody wants a pair. (laughs) No, nobody wants a pair. No, definitely not. So, all right, and, look, and appreciate you sharing that with us. And obviously, you know, these things are a little bit public when you're involved in tournaments. But yeah, this is what happens to elite anglers who are not involved in tournaments. And it's what happens to everyday anglers as well. You have good days, you have bad days. And sometimes your strategy works. Sometimes your strategy doesn't work. But I guess the, the reason I'm, I'm keen to talk to you, Deethi, and the reason I love talking to tournament anglers in general is, you know, when we talk about the things that make a difference between really good fishers and those that are maybe trying to get to that next level, often we talk about those one percenters. It's all those little things that the really good anglers do and that they're all adding a little bit, little bit, little bit, and at the end they all add up you know, to something significant. So I want to just explore a little bit what some of those one percenters are for you and, and going right from the start, sort of planning the trip, executing the trip, and then when you're on the water, what do you do? What are those one percenters? So Could you maybe give us a bit of a, let's start by picturing ourselves heading to a system, in your case, it might have been the BEM, let's say, what's your thought process? Okay, the comp's going to be at the BEM, it's going to be on these dates, where do you start your planning and and what does that look like? What what are the things that you need to know before you start putting lures together or anything else? Yeah, okay, so look, so BEM River, in this particular comp, like it's not my local, so it's like six, seven hours down the road, so you have to plan. Yeah, that's why I picked it. Now, to be honest, I hadn't done a lot of the pre-planning that you're speaking about for this particular event, but I had done some, I'd done a couple of podcasts on it and talked to people and got a bit of an idea about where to fish in that location. And my plan for that comp was mostly to pre-fish, like to go down there and and smash out a big pre-fish and work around. Now, I guess this goes against what we're talking about because it didn't actually pan out that way, where there was foul (laughs) for the pre-fish. So this this is ideally what you would do. Like we've got the George's River comp coming up in a couple of months. In another month, sorry. Now, first thing you do is check out the tides for the comp. You want to know whether you're going to run in, run out, and then time of year. You've got to have a, a bit of an idea of whether the fish are going to be upriver, downriver, or you know when the spawning patterns are. So as we come into this next comp, it'll be a transitioning period. So the the fish have kind of moved out of the shallows. I would expect. And we'll be mostly in the deep. So you've got to take all that sort of stuff in the, into consideration. You've got two species as well, haven't you? I mean, you've got the, the black brim, you've got the, the yellowfin brim, and their habits are slightly different. So do you have to decide which species am I going to target or which, what's the thought process there? Well, yeah, you definitely can. If we transition back to the southern estuaries, definitely, if you're going to char- target yellowfin, you're probably going to be down the front of the system, like right down the very front of the system. Whereas if you're going to target black brim, You'll be up the back and in the deeper areas and, and that sort of stuff typically. And then you've got, then got to look at your lures. Like in general terms, a black brim is probably going to prefer a slight, if you're talking hard bodies, like a, a slightly longer profile lure. And they typically like the lure pause more. So if you're going to fish for them, you're going to do a twitch and pause more than you would for a yellow fin brim. Whereas with a yellow fin brim, a lot of times you can just slow roll the lure and keep working it back. Definitely, you got to look at the types of the types of brim that you're going to target. I guess it depends a little bit on the, you know, on the time of year as well, doesn't it? Because, like I say, their habits are slightly different. So, if you were targeting yellowfin brim this time of year, this transitional period, they're going to be probably heading down towards the front of the system. They like to spawn out in the headlands. The black brim, they're going to be schooling up in the deeper water, probably preparing to go a little bit upstream. They like that kind of salt wedge, fresh versus uh, salt sort of regime for their spawning. So. 
you might be fishing in completely different parts of the system depending on which species you're going to target. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and like you were saying, they, they do tend to transition into the deeper areas. So as we roll into winter, we're looking more at, at deep plastics and blades and that sort of stuff. So you certainly want to be prepared for that. I mean, having said that, there is the anomaly where, where you're going to find them in the shallows on any given day. And competitions will prove that to you because you'll find everyone's fishing deep because it's winter and then somebody goes and cracks a massive yeah. bag on the edges. <laughs> so there's always the anomaly, but but in general terms, yeah, we're going to be fishing deeper in the winter, which is what we're coming into. Yep. And I, I mean, I do remember having a conversation about that with, or along that line with Chase Wilhelm a couple of years back, and he was basically saying, people go out and they say, oh, the fish are shut down or the fishing's really tough or whatever. But if you look at any tournament, it doesn't matter, barra, bass, brim, flathead, doesn't matter. Any tournament, any conditions, there's always somebody goes out and nails a bag. There's always somebody on, somebody on that podium. And there might be a whole bunch of people have got a good bag or there might be a whole bunch of people that didn't do very well, but there's always somebody. So if you know how to work the conditions, you know the species, and, and I guess particularly if you've got a little bit of local knowledge, you can always put a few fish in the boat. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the comp that just went past, the word to me was, these fish are going to be deep. This is what we're told. So I was very prepared for that. As it turns out, I couldn't get them in the deep. They did get, the guys did get them, but I, personally I couldn't. I know two out of the top three anglers were fishing in less than a meter and a half of water on this given given comp. So yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, another story. If we, if, I want to double back to the one percenters. So with your one percenters, one of the things that that is key is your knots. You have to like if you want, yeah, if you want to catch fish, you want to catch big fish. You've got to get your knots right. Now the re- <laughs> the reason I share this story is because this little comp that I did last weekend, the weekend before. The first fish that I hooked, I popped a leader knot. Now, I haven't done, I tie FG knots and I tie them by hand. And, and to be honest, I think I tie them pretty well. But not this one. This one just popped. As soon as it loaded up, I dropped that brim. So that, that would have been not getting a donut. And then in terms of the second one percenter, I hadn't paid attention to my drag. So next fish, I was up standing up on my kayak, rod high in the air, getting ready to hoist this brim out over the oyster leases. And I hooked it and I went, here we go. And it just peeled drag <laughs> off and ran me around a pole. So one percenters, they're, they're really important. And look, there's a, there's a few things that, that I think are key, like your knots, obviously. Uh, the condition of your line. I guess I made a few errors with this comp because Josh Carpenter, who we interviewed a week or so back, he came up, he was looking at these long rods that I've got and he's gone, what's going on with your line, mate? Oh, what do you mean? My line's perfect. Anyway, it wasn't perfect. <laughs> In the braid, there was this really thin bit in the braid. I don't know what caused it or why it was there, but and it was about halfway up the rod. So he's, yeah, so I guess that's definitely a 1% of making sure your gear's up, up to scratch. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I've just come back from a, a trip up Tinaru with a, with a guide and a colleague, and we were preparing to go out in the lake and, and have a fish for some barra. And, but my mate had tied a new leader on his line and he tensioned. I watched him tie it. I watched him tension it. It was an FG knot. And the guide came along and said, I'm just going to check your knots. And he pulled it and the leader pulled. And, and I thought, well, hang on. Now I watched, <laughs> you know, I watched as that knot got seriously tensioned. I watched it change color. And so we got him to tie the knot again and it popped a second time. And then we, we looked more closely and what happened was when he tied his first half hitch, he hadn't gone around the tag end of the leader. He'd gone underneath the tag end of the leader. Oh. And so we tied it several times and tried it. And it's just amazing how one little mistake like that that made all the difference. As soon as we put the tag end back back underneath that first half hitch, tension the knot, then tied the rizzuto, no problems, didn't pop another leader. So wow. <laughs> such small things can make such a big difference sometimes. Exactly. And what sort of line class were you using? What were you chasing? Uh, that was 30 pound braid and 100 pound mono leaders. So. Wow, that would still take a fair bit to pop that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's very, very interesting. Yeah. Look, you're not so critical. And for anyone that's, that's sort of just getting into it, the FG knot, there's a there's about six different ways you can tie it. It's worth sitting down in your lounge room one night with whatever pound you're using. But I, I suggest you start with a small something small, maybe four or six pound, so you can test it to breaking point. Like if you run them 10, 12 pound, it's gonna be hard unless you've got knot pullers and stuff. But four pound, you should be able to break it probably. Like an FG knot is particularly strong. So definitely sit down and, and have a practice with that. Now the second one was is your terminal knots. Now, I use two terminal knots now. 
So I basically use a uni knot, just four or five turns. That's if I want the knot to go hard down onto the hook or to the ring. Yep. And then I use just a simple loop knot. I think it's a lefty's loop or something like that, where you basically tie a little, to describe it, tie a little granny knot in it, um, go down through the hook and back up through the loop that you made in the granny knot, four or five turns up the line, and then back through that loop again and pull it tight. Now, those are, those are the three knots that I typically use, and for the most part, they serve me really well. Yep. And you, like most tournament anglers, I'd imagine, you retie all your leaders the night before, test them all, you're starting out with new leaders on every rod? Yep. Yep. Every, for every comp day, I generally don't do it for practice. And like the last comp where I got a donut, I didn't tie any leaders the next day. Right. But <laughs> in general terms, any rod that I've used, it will get new line, you peel it off, and sometimes I'll take maybe one, two meters of the, the braid off as well just to get back to fresh line. I think it's, you don't want to lose a fish that might cost you a place or two places or 10 places. So yeah, definitely new leaders. Yeah. And look, I guess that's the difference with, with tournament fishing. But, and again, to hark back to the recent trip I did up to, to Tenaru, we went tournament fishing, but we had maybe three, in two days of solid fishing, we had maybe three chances at a, at a quality barra. Two of them we converted. We didn't. The third one just didn't hook up. But if that leader knot had popped on one of those fish, then the <laughs> conversion rate would have been significantly lower for something that was avoidable. Exactly. And if your guide hadn't have tested that, you wouldn't have known. You would have popped the first one and then probably popped the second one. So Exactly. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a good shout. And I was quite confused by what by you saying originally how it popped because FG knot is a fantastic knot. So, yeah. Yeah. And as I say, you know, I tie FG knots in the dark, in the wind, no problems whatsoever. And I sat and watched this guy tie this knot. He asked me to watch him tie it. I watched him tension it. And yeah, it was just a very, very small mistake that I didn't pick up. And it made all the difference. So yeah, don't tell anyone. Keep that one under your hat. That, <laughs> might, that might cause somebody else to drop that tournament winning fish and put you on the podium, mate. Oh, exactly. Well, no, no. I, I want people to catch the best fish they can, mate. <laughs> yeah. You're too much of a nice guy, mate. You... <laughs> yeah, look, we want people to do the best they can, and I want of to beat the guy at the course. top of his game. Uh, one thing I would ask is, for yourself, are you tying risottos on all the ends of your FG knots? Yeah, I, I do routinely, yeah. So I usually, I tie 15 to 20 twists of the FG, and then I'll tie a, a half hitch and put a final bit of tension on it. So I try and keep the tension on all the way through. I uh, do a half hitch, and then I'll do a risotto. And sometimes if I'm feeling a little bit nervous, I'll do a second risotto just to be sure. So really, it doesn't change the effectiveness of the knot. It's just that I get concerned when we're slinging lures through guides, cast after cast after cast, that that rigido is going to start to come undone at the end. And in fact, I will use sometimes a little bit of loon or super glue just on the rigido as well, not on the whole knot, just depending on what I'm doing. Wow. Wow. That's like a a fraction of a 1% to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, I don't like the idea of a loon. I don't think I've ever had an FG go, actually. I don't think I've ever had... I've had... Uni uni knots back in the day when I was using those double unis, but I don't think I've ever had an FG knot let go. Yeah. So if you were using double unis back then, or like, did you know what sort of difference did you you notice when you went to an FG? I think the main difference I noticed really was just the, the way the line flows through the guides, both during the cast and when you're trying to get it, you've got a longer lead and you're trying to get a fish to the side of the boat. So for, for me, that was the main thing. And I mean, I went from double unis, then I went to when I was fishing anything sort of. 10 kilo or upwards, then I'd be tying bimini twists and you know, slim beauties to, to finish off the uh, the leader. So I actually find the FG is a lot quicker and easier than doing a bimini and a, and a slim beauty. It's a lot less messing around. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason I ask you that is because when I was tying double, u- yeah, double unis and doubling line over and doing all this sort of stuff. And then once I went to the FG, same thing, I could use, I went to rods with smaller guides. Yep. I found I broke so many less leader knots. Like I used to break them with double unis. Yeah. Yep. And then after a comp, I usually fish for the next two to three weeks on the same leaders because they don't break. So, yeah, massive difference. No, look, that's right. And, you know, I think, you know, we use a lot of bait cast gear. And so most of the guides are micro guides. You've got the, the line thread on the reel. You get a knot jammed in there. That's a, <laughs> that's a real problem when you're trying to land a fish. So, yeah, the, the LFG has been a bit of a game changer in a lot of ways, making leaders much more sort of wind-on friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, look, knots are really important. Uh, and I'll ask you, like, I, I use the uni knot as a terminal knot. What do you personally use as a terminal knot? Same, mate. If I want to clinch it down, I use a, use a uni knot. And more often than not, I'm going to tie lefty's loop 
for most things, but yeah, occasionally I'll tie a uni. Yep. Yeah. So same three knots, mate. We must be on the same page, you know. Same page. Got yeah, great um, minds. Something like that. I yeah, mean, we're I, both doing that together. <laughs> well, <laughs> mate, there's every chance. There's every chance. Don't tell anyone. Look, a, a couple of things. Do you the to pull your knots tight? So you use a much heavier gear than what than what we use. What? Well, how are you pulling your knots tight? Because pulling it on 10, 20, 30 pound lines is a bit different to four pound. Yeah, yeah. I do a couple of things. I, I actually don't like to over tension them. I think with, and maybe I'm wrong on this, I don't know, but I think with FG knots, they dig into the uh, into the leader, right? Particularly if you're using fluorocarbon, so they, they break in through that tough outer crust. And so I think it's important to tension them to a point. I see people, you know, with they'll get a couple of broomsticks or dowels or something, they'll wrap the line around one and they'll wrap the leader around the other and they'll put all this tension on it. And I think you're actually over-tensioning the knot and potentially creating a weakness there. So I like to get them to the point where that knot just starts to change colour and then that's it. And then I won't, won't pull it any harder than that. So for me, usually, even with 30-pound braid, I'll pull a sleeve down over my forearm, I'll wrap, wrap around my forearm, I'll grab the leader, wrap that around my hand. And if I need to put more tension on it than that, I reckon I'm over-tensioning the knot, right? So I don't usually have to wrap it around anything to get tension on it. Yeah, okay. What about yourself? I mean, you're much finer lines. How do you... Because it, it, that tension's so important, isn't it, with an FG? I mean, it's that finger track mechanism. So you want even tension across the knot and then you want to snug it down a little bit without, in your case, be very easy to over-tension it with light gear. Yeah, 100%. Well, I, I don't use any tools to tension it. And when I wrap the line, the way I tie it is I'll ro- lay the rod, rod down in front of me. I'll bring the line back up into my mouth, hold the, the main line in that, and then wrap the leader around it. But when you do it by hand, you've got to, I don't know how to explain it for a podcast, but you've got to kind of slide the line down down the other one so it wraps really tight and sits snug like a coil. Like it's really important just how your hand moves when you do it to wrap it neatly. Now, the other thing is, is I'm interested, like you, you're using a lot less wraps, but I found if I only do, say, 20 wraps on four pound or three pound or sometimes even two pound, we're, we're doing it. I can't get it to hold. Like I'm okay. usually doing That's closer to yeah. 30. I understand that, that it's supposed to tighten up in the bottom of the knot, but the reality is that I've found is that I need those extra wraps or whatever so that it doesn't pull through. It's interesting, you know, I, I used to do 30 to 40 wraps and then I'd, I'd tension it and then I'd put half a dozen half hitches and then a couple of rigidos and, and then I'd trim the tag end and I'd try and put another rigido over the top of that so I'd just sort of lay the tag end down nice and flat. I don't do any of that anymore. and. Even, you know, when I'm jigging offshore, it's 15 to 20 turns is, is enough. And maybe it's because I'm using heavier leaders as well. There's a lot less opportunity for a heavy leader to, the braid can really bed down on a heavy leader and there's a lot less chance of that sort of slipping yeah. through. So maybe that's part of what's going on there. But I mean, in theory, with that finger trap mechanism, if you put too many turns on there, then that the top end where the braid is of that knot, in theory, shouldn't be tightening up anymore. So you can't actually get any better, <laughs> better grip on it. Yeah. And I understand that, but I think it could have to do with the diameter of the line. Like if you're wrapping around a, you know, let's say a 30 pound liter, it's much different to, to a four pound liter or a three or a two. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. not sure. And I think there's a, probably there's a fair bit of, you know, the, the difference in diameter of the braid and the leader in terms of the style of fishing I'm doing is probably like greater too. So you look at the braid you're using, what are you using? Four pound, five pound braid, oh. six and 10 pound leader, something like that. Yeah, other way around. A lot okay. of times, four pound leader, and it might be twelve pound braid, but it's only point okay. four pe, so it, it's tiny braid. So the yeah, the braid's going to be still going to be thinner than your leader, but it's they're going to be pretty close. But if you look at what we're doing up here, so for example, if I'm I'm doing slow pitch stuff, I'm using pe two two point five line, and then I'm using eighty pound mono leader, right? So there's a huge difference in the diameters of those two lines. So I suspect that that braid's going to really bed down a lot tighter in that thicker leader material. So that may be what's going on. Anyway, we're, we're getting a little bit off track here, getting, <laughs> getting into the, to the theory of knots. It's not something I'm an expert in. So I'm, I've probably already said too much and showed my ignorance to anyone that is an expert, mate. Oh, well, there you go. Hey, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, do what works for you. At the end of the day, you know, you, if you've never had a leader not go, then you're doing something right. Or if you just have the occasional one go, you're doing something right. But if you're not sure, like you said earlier on, sit in your lounge room in front of the TV, whatever, you know, when you get a spare 10 minutes, sit down, tie a few knots, time, 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 test them and see what works, you know, and, and experiment with different lengths of knot if you need to. Exactly. 
And look, in terms of one percent, is there something else that I'm that I'm really passionate about, and that's your hooks. So in the brim fishing, we we're using a few different things: jig heads, hidden weights, trebles, and that sort of stuff. Now, if you're going to go and fish a competition, you're going to go and try it, or even if you're not fishing a competition, you want to land fish. These hooks need to be in pristine condition. Like I don't take old hooks out and fish a comp ever, like ever. Like if I'm fishing a, a competition in a hard body. Like 90% of the time, unless it's a lure I can't get, it's actually a new lure for comp day because two things, hook come out. Sometimes I don't use the hooks in the packet, but but a lot of times I do. But also the actual lure itself, if the lure's been in your box and kicking around, it's been in the salt, often you get a little bit of corrosion where that hook goes into the into the lure yep. and you'll pull a hook on the fish that you want. You're not going to lose the little one. You're going to lose the big one. Yeah, I mean, that's a golden rule of fishing, isn't it? It doesn't matter. Yeah. You, you... It doesn't matter whether you're fishing a tournament, whether you're a guide, whether you're just out, you've paid for that trip of a lifetime, you're not going to lose little fish. Mm-hmm. And if you do, you're not going to care about that one, but it's the big ones. <laughs> the, the ones you're going to remember, they're the ones you're going to lose. So, Yeah, exactly. It's the one, you, the one that you want. So, and look, there's a couple of things that, that happen with your hooks if you're catching multiple fish. Like the Bem River comp, I, I caught a bunch of fish. And what can happen with, with brim in particular is they can actually snap the, the tops off the hook. You can lose the point on your hook. And you go, I'm getting bites and I'm pulling the fish in a couple of meters and then dropping it. And yep. You have a close look at your hook. Sometimes that hook's going to be either bent over or snapped off. You just snap the top little bit off it and you need to change it out because you're going to drop more fish than you land. Yeah, yep. And you think about on those super fine lines that you're using as well and the brim having that tough, tough mouth, peg-like teeth, if you don't have a good point on there, it's really hard to drive a, a blunt hook home hmm. with fine gear, you know? That's exactly right. And it's one of those things, like if you cast out and you, you drop a few fish in a few bites, it's like really have a look at your hooks or just change them. Even if they look good, just swap them out so you take that out of the equation. You're not out there going, this fish is going to fall off. You go, I've done everything I can. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a confidence thing as well. Are you a, a sense kind of a guy, attractant sort of a guy? I like scent. Oh, yeah, yep. I do. I do. And I use a couple. So I use Sack Scent. Yep. I've used the Gulp Scent. I've used, oh, I can't think of the name of the other one. But anyway, but yes, I use Scents. Absolutely. Okay. I think they make a difference. So, and got a favorite or does it vary depending on the day? For the most part, I use Sack Scent in a couple of different colors. So Bloodworm, Crab, he's got a bunch of them. And even sometimes this might sound bad. It's actually just whatever's hanging around my neck. Right. <laughs> and part of it's just a confidence thing. I go, all right. I'm going to do everything I can to help me catch a fish. And yeah, when I, when I won the comp down at Bent River, the lures were always had scent on the whole weekend, even though they're a tiny little lure. Did it help? I don't know. It helped my confidence. So Yeah, yeah. How often do you apply it, mate? Down there, probably every fourth cast. Okay. But you have a look at it. The sack scent that I was using there sticks on really well. Now, I, I have listened to your other scent ones, and maybe that's not the ideal thing, but you can always see it. So... It's there. You know, it's doing something, yeah. It's, yeah, it's doing something. It's better than, than just the plastic. So, yeah, yeah. Now, I know, and, and you've probably heard in the Team Doc Lewis area, I've got the interview that I did with Ben Diggles, which Ben, of course, being part creator of the um, Squidgy's S Factor scent. And Ben made the comment if you put too much scent on a lure, it's kind of like putting too much chili on your food. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it actually can detract from the uh, attractiveness of your lure. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's probably exactly right. That's interesting. I haven't used the squidgy scent in a while, but yeah, once again, a very good scent. So, yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, when you say sometimes you just use the one that's hanging around your neck, to some extent, I, I often question, you know, do fish actually smell an attraction on your lure and go, oh, that smells like bloodworm or that smells like crab or that smell? Is that lure imitating that particular bait species anyway? Or is it just that the fish get that waft of, a, they're really sensitive to amino acids, right? That's one of the things. And, and most of the better scents have got pheromones and amino acids and that sort of thing in that the fish are, are quite sensitive to. So I, I just wonder sometimes if it doesn't really matter as long as there's that little bit of sort of protein molecule floating around, that, that's all it needs. I think that's where I sit in that camp. It's just something you just, it's something to make, like you watch a fish follow a lure without scent and it doesn't hit it. You go, well, if I had scent on it, would it hit it? And I think I've had enough instances where I've, I've applied scent and caught a fish next cast when I haven't been able to catch one for 20 minutes. That yep. It's doing something, so that's why I use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you think there's kind of, when you think about, you know, from a, 
a non-tournament angler's perspective and, and what we might be able to learn from what you tournament guys do. There's kind of two things. So one is the preparation sort of stuff. And we had a bit of a talk about that. And maybe we're starting to cross into this next question a little bit. But the second thing is, you know, if you look at Ben River, right, you had a, you had a purple patch, right? Things were working for you for whatever reason, whether it was good planning or whether it was just pure dumb luck, it doesn't really matter. You, you struck the right formula and then you capitalized on it and you'd done all those one percenters, your knots were holding, your leaders were holding, your hooks were sharp, you were boating fish. Yeah. What about those days like the following comp where you donated? So this is where your yeah, tournament anglers then have to start pulling all the tricks out of the book. So what are some of the things that you probably would try on a day like that where you go out there, you've got a game plan, and clearly, after the first hour or two, <laughs> there's no fish in the boat, not looking like being any fish in the boat, you've really got to reassess and start again. So what's the kind of thought process then about what am I going to do next? What are the, the priorities to try next? Yeah, okay. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. So I think we're going to double back and we'll use that Woi Woi comp as, a, as an example. So one of the mistakes I made, it's not that I hadn't done preparation, but I chose not to have the day off work on Friday and have a pre-fish. And I just went up there in the afternoon. I got a couple of hours and didn't catch fish. Now, I think first thing I should have prepared by going and having that pre-fish. So mm. that was the first thing I would say. I think I, I missed out there. The next thing, in hindsight, I think I needed to give up on that day on the things that weren't working. I went and fished the shallows. And I, although I did hit a couple of fish, I should have gone exploring more. I should have changed up the lures and done that sort of stuff more. In my mind, I'm like, they're going to come on. I've caught fish here. We're just waiting for the tide to come up. But it didn't happen. I needed to go and explore other options in terms of different lures and different structure. So, and the other thing in terms of, like, don't give up. Like, you can find that there's plenty of times I go out, like, although I've had good success in comps, there's plenty of times I go out and I have a shocking morning. But by just hanging around and hanging around and fishing, you might find the last two hours of the day are sensational. So whether it's a bite period, whether you've moved into the right zone or you've changed lures, just time on the water is going to be yeah. key in that sort of thing. Like, don't give up. You can't, can't catch fish if your lure's not in the water. No, that's right. That's right. And it's happened too many times that, yeah, just at the end of the day, you've been fishing for six hours, caught nothing. In the last two hours, you just brain them and you go, how good was that day? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and then look, it's the same for casual social anglers as well. You know, you could spend... As we did up at dinner the other day, we spend hours and hours and hours on the water. It could have been a, a donut trip. You know, we might not have had those two or three opportunities and we would have gone home, you know, without having hooked a fish. But right at the end of the day, on the last day, bang, 115 centimeter barra. Best trip ever. You know, fantastic. Exactly. That's, exactly, that's exactly right. <laughs> and that's after two days of fishing. Now, if we'd gone, oh, look, it's just not going to happen for us today. We got one yesterday, but we fished for eight hours today, haven't caught a fish. Time to pull up stumps, go and have a beer and go home, we wouldn't have got that result. So, yeah, so, so often that just seems to happen if you keep putting that time in, hey? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And while you're talking there, I was thinking, you know, it's been like if you're out in the water and it's not happening and I'm chasing brim, probably I'm going to go and try and fish the bottom of structure. So whether it be a pole or a bridge or a mooring block, I'm going to fish the bottom and I'm going to slow down. So I'm going to make the lure move slower through the water and probably go lighter. So even if I'm fishing the bottom structure, I'm going to try and get that, that lure to float down as softly as possible to try and elicit a strike. So that, those would be the key things. Slow down, fish the bottom of structure. So let's move away from Woi Woi for a minute because whatever was happening at Woi Woi, you didn't crack it, no, right? No. You know? so, so you might have gone and fished bridges and pylons and things and fished deeper and slower, but that didn't work for you on the day. No, what I want to really. do now is turn to a day, one like you've just described, turn to a, a tournament where you can think back and you go, okay, you know, I didn't even look like I was, I looked like I was going to donut that day. And then all of, this, all of a sudden, I'm in the hut, maybe I got on the podium, maybe I didn't, but I got some quality fish and you know, didn't make a fool of myself being out there for the day. So have you got one in mind where that happened? Yep. Walk us through that one. Tell us about what you changed there and how that changed your results. Okay. So this was one down on St. George's Basin. This was a grand final of the Southern Brim series a long time ago. Anyway, what I used to do down there was fish the shallows with tiny crankbaits, like Rebel Jointed was, was probably our go-to back then, bevy minnows and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, and, and we do really well. So I fished this comp. Conditions were good, a little bit of breeze. We're drifting, drift shoots out. Everything's good, except I can't catch a fish. <laughs> so comp starts at 11, at 7. 
by 11 o'clock, I had no fish. There's an hour's paddle to get back. So I've got two hours worth of fishing. Anyway, this particular comp, I just saw a ripple out of the corner of my eye and I put on a tiny little surface lure, a TT pencil. So tiny little 40 millimeter surface lure. And for the next two hours, I think I got nearly a dozen fish. Mm. Brim, I got lots of stuff. Got brim, whiting, blackfish, all sorts of stuff. Obviously thinking it's prawn. And that that put me in, I don't know what position I was. I did all right on that day. But then leading into the next day, it was a different system, same area, same lure. By quarter to eight, so within 15 minutes, I had my bag and wow. I won the comp. <laughs> so it was just a change. Like gone from gone to a surface lure, which was not what I was expecting, but that's what they were hitting. Mm. So yeah, mm. same water, exact same water. And a wonderful example of yeah how being observant when you're out on the water and how being a thinking. I mean, people think fishing is one of those things where you go, you chill out, you let your mind wander, you you just you're vaguing out, but successful fishing is not like that at all. You know, really successful anglers, it's, it's very much a thinking game. It's very much a strategic game. So you'd had a bad start to the day, but as you were paddling back, you were, your eyes were open, you spotted a, you know, you got, you saw an indication of what was going on, got a bit of a hint and thought about it and threw the right lure at the right time and the rest's history. So really important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was at what turned out, it's one of those days where you go, you fish for nothing, fish for nothing, fish for nothing. Yeah, and either you make a change or the environment changes, yep. and then it all comes together for you. And it turns out to be such a great day. So, so yeah, yeah. You, yeah. And look, you know, just quietly, whether it's you that makes a change or the environment makes a change for you, you're going to claim it, aren't you? Oh, hundred percent. It was definitely me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Ethan, the other thing that I always find interesting talking to tournament guys, and and I think this is something that. As social anglers and, and, and casual anglers probably don't think about so much, but it's just as important is about that mindset kind of stuff, right? So you're going into a comp. Now, I marveled that you shot down to BEM because I know that you'd had a period of time prior to BEM where you hadn't got out on the water much. And you, know, you and I were talking, you're going, geez, I haven't been doing much fishing. And then you shot down to BEM and you finished up winning the comp. So I'm interested in what your mindset was, was going down there. Did you feel quietly confident that you were in with a chance or were you thinking, ah, oh, crap, I really needed to get my casting dialed in and really be on point before I got here? You know, I'm starting from the back of the field. What were your thoughts before that comp started? I actually didn't think, I hadn't thought I was a chance of winning, honestly. That was such a big comp, a lot of people, a lot of variables. Yep. I mean, doing well was on my radar, but not winning. So I was as surprised as anyone to, to take the win. But I was ready. My rods were rigged. Everything was done. The hooks were done. Like everything was good to go. I was prepared for the comp. And particularly after the pre fish, where we were only out in the water for a couple of hours because it was windy as. So with four or five hours to rig up, everything's perfect. I know where everything is. It's all the hooks are sharp. So, so yeah. So that and mindset in, in terms of going down there, I wasn't ready to win, but I'm always going to back myself to get three fish, except for at Woiwoi. And yeah, I back myself to be able to do it. So yeah, and I'll cast all day. Like I'll I'll be out there fishing to the death. And look, a good example of that was was not necessarily me, but we'll go back to we'll go back to Woi Woi where everything was bad. Oh, I was going to take you back there in a minute <laughs> anyway. So yeah, let, let's do it. So look, yeah, we're paddling back on day. I think it was day two. Might have been day one. I can't remember. Anyway, it's it's about fifteen minutes to go in the comp, and I see see a guy on a fish. And anyway, it was a 39 fork, so I was like probably 1.1 kilo, so kick a fish. Yep. Within, within about, it would have been inside 20 minutes left in the competition. Mm. So the whole mindset of, of keep casting like it might happen, it just happens really often. So yep. yeah, keep going, don't give up until the death. So yeah. Cool. So you, you've come off BEM, you've done, you're quite like, and look, for the folks at home that are listening in, you listen to Deethy on the podcast. He sounds like a cruisy, laid-back character, and he is a cruisy, laid-back character, but I have it on good authority that once he hits the water, he's a bit of an animal, right? That he's, he's a very competitive sort of a dude, and he's not going to give up. Not, nice guy, but he's out there to win. Make no mistake about that. So, so you've gone from Bem, where you got this result that was probably better than you expected. You were confident, but it was better than you expected. You go to Woi Woi, you're on a high. So what happens there? What happened to your mindset? Oh, I'm just curious about, after a couple of hours on the water, 
what are you then thinking? Yeah, well, that's a good point. So I go to BAM and I think, yeah, probably can't win. I go to Woi Woi, I think, yeah, I can definitely win. Yeah. But I had the pre-fish and I'm definitely a confidence fisherman. So when I didn't get like a fish in a couple, I thought a couple of hours I can get a fish, but I couldn't. That actually rocked me a little bit. And then yeah, comp day, I had one spot I was going to go to and then head back the other way. There was about six anglers in within a 80 meter stretch because there's a lot of people there. And at that point, I hate to say this, but I was thinking, oh, what if I got a donut? <laughs> so, and I was like, oh, no, no, you're not going to get a donut. You'll find them. You'll find them. Anyway, I didn't. So the mindset probably wasn't quite where it was meant to be. Yeah. And then on the Sunday, honestly, once I got a fish and I wasn't going to get a double donut, I, I just wasn't focused anymore. I was so far out of it. I was just like in the, in the interview I did with Hobie Media, I was like, I just want to be in the top 100. <laughs> so, so I achieved that. It was 81, I think, in the end. I think that the reason I was really happy to share that is obviously I've done really well at BAM. I've done well in a lot of comps and achieved a, a world win, but you still have donuts. You still have a day that really sucks. And so what's your strategy now going into the next comp having having had that day? And I'm thinking as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about Morgo and I'm kind of digging the finger into him, him a little bit here because... It's always fun to you know feel somebody else's pain, but you know he he went through that period where he came off a high, and then he had a series of donuts, and it went for a long time. This is one of the best anglers in the comp. Suddenly, can't put a fish in the boat, and so what's the process then for getting your head back in the game? Because that's so important, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So leading up to George's, we've got three, two more weeks of pre-fishing. So I'll, this weekend coming, so it's not Friday when we're recording. I'll fish both days on the weekend, not for the whole whole weekend, but I'll fish both days. And then I'm going to get out as many times if I can sneak out for two hours in the afternoon. So that's the first point. I'm going to fish as much as I, I can up until the pre-fish ban. Then once I've done that, then I'll have a, a bit more of an idea of where I'm going to go. And then I'm just going to hone in on that plan. So whether it's deep or shallow, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll just be basically working on that. And I will take the Friday off or at least most of the Friday off to go pre-fishing. I'm not going to miss the pre-fish. You're not, not looking well there, mate. You're, just, you're starting to develop a bit of a flu in advance? Uh, <laughs> no, no. no, it's my local waterway. It's all right. I can get some time. I'll, I'll probably <laughs> go to time. work in the morning and then just, just knock off a bit early. So. Sure. So, yeah, but preparation. Preparation is the big thing. And look, you know, this is something that tournament anglers have to do, just like any sportsman has to do, right? Like, Elite athletes, whether they're Olympians or golfers or tennis players, you know, their coaches have them envisaging themselves playing shots or hitting balls or they're standing on the podium, whatever it is. They're kind of getting their mind into the right place. And I think that a lot of social anglers don't do this. And and I know I can can name a couple of fishing guides that I fished with who will launch their boat off a dirt ramp somewhere. They don't want to go to the main boat ramp because they don't want their clients to talk to somebody at the ramp who says, oh, we've been here for three days and we haven't caught a fish yet, right? They want their clients to go out on the water confident and not hear all this feedback from people who probably didn't catch a fish because they've been drinking beer more than they've been fishing, right? Yeah. But it's that mindset thing that happens at the ramp. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And and I guess I've heard that a lot. People go, yeah, there's no fish, there's no fish, there's no fish. Personally, I never believe it until I've been out there and they go, okay, they're all right. But for the most part, they're not going to be right. You're going to find fish if, if you know what to do. So, yeah. As we said earlier on, somebody always brings in a bag of fish. Somebody always ends up on that podium. That's right. And that's the beautiful thing about the comps. It's like I, I really did have a bad comp at Woi Woi, but I was able to talk to the winners and worked out exactly mm. what they, you know, they told, I didn't have to work it out. They told me what they did. And um, you can go, okay, that's what I did wrong. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. And I've never been a tournament angler, Deethi. I've never been in that tournament scene. I have to say that when I first started the podcast, I started talking to a lot of tournament anglers. I was really surprised when they started telling me that. I was, I was kind of imagining that most tournament anglers, they're going to keep things pretty close to their chest, right? But I was surprised at how much information sharing does go on between competitors. Yeah, look, and I think the tide's turning a little bit on that. I think if you go back 20 years, I think there was a lot more secrecy. Mm. But I found, particularly with the podcast that I've been recording, Guys are, are really giving it up. I mean, but for for anyone that's listening out there, you've you've got to go out and put this into practice. You've got to go and have a go at it. It's one thing for me to tell you to go and use a shallow running hard body against the rocks and all this sort of stuff, but you've got to go and work out how to do it and make it your own. You've got to own that information. Otherwise, it's it's just talk and hearsay. 
Yeah, that's right. You, you can listen to as many podcasts as you like and you can watch as much YouTube as you like, but until you actually go out there and do it. It actually reminds me of a, a funny little story that has nothing to do with fishing, but a couple of years back, my young daughter decided she was going to learn how to play flute. And so she's got a flute and I've said, now her uncle is a, is a very good musician. I said, get Uncle Chris to show you how to use the flute. She said, no, no, I know how to do it. I've seen him do it. And so she started trying to play the flute. Obviously couldn't get a sound out of it. But the point is, you can see something. You can study music as much as you like, but until you pick an instrument up and start learning to play it, they're two completely different things. So having that information, having that knowledge is one thing, having the experience of time on the water and keeping your skills sharp, that's another thing altogether. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. You've, you've got to practice it. And I think that's where definitely myself and a lot of anglers are confident in sharing whatever they need to share. Like people have still got to go and take that information and put it into practice. But I mean, one thing I wanted to touch on is leading up to this comp. So we're coming up to a comp in the middle of June. It's a transition period. When I pre-fish, I'm going to pre-fish with a few things in mind. I'm going to start in the shallows first thing in the morning and I'm going to fish the edge of the water and see if that works. I've, I'm still going to throw surface. Like I've caught fish on surface down here in the cold months. Sometimes it happens. Most times it's not. But anyway, I'm going to start in the shallows and then I'm going to slowly work into the deep through to blades and, and plastics and what have you. And then, then I'm also going to go and hit all the different types of structures. So you've got boats and mooring blocks under boats. You've got pontoons and jetties and then bridges and then your natural stru- structure like rock walls. So in the pre-fish, I'm going to hit all those different things to try and work out a pattern of where I think they are. And then with these comps, we'll have, I think it's two weeks off where you can't fish it. And then the Friday, I'm going to go back and I'm going to hone in again and try and work it out in a couple of hours so that when it comes to comp day, if I find them, say, on boat holes, I was going to fish boat holes for the comp. So I'm going to try and dial that in over a few sessions. So hopefully that's helpful to some anglers out there, whether it's comp fishing or not, it's really relevant. Absolutely. And look, one of the things if you're, again, if you're not a tournament angler, this is, this is the takeaway from this. Tournament guys don't just turn up on the day at the start gun, chuff off out there and start catching fish, right? You can hear there's been a fair bit of thought go into strategy for the day. There's this pre-fish thing going on as well. So for those who kind of, and I hear stories, oh, we're going up to the Northern Territory, we're going to fish this river for two days and this river for three days and then this river for a day, you'd be better off to go to one spot and fish it for a week or 10 days, right? Because it takes some time, doesn't matter if you know the species, doesn't matter if you know the location. It's different this time than what it was last time you went there. It doesn't matter if it's brim or snapper or flathead or any any other species. Yeah. So it takes time on the water, firstly, to find your feet and figure out what the fish are doing. And you can't just do that in a couple of hours, right? Unless you're with a guide who's out there all the time. That's a great advantage of going out with a guide Mm -hmm. or or a tournament angler who's a boaty. You know, these are people who are on the water all the time, know where where to go, got their finger on the pulse. And so you've got that opportunity to use somebody else's experience somebody else's knowledge but if you're going there on your own don't expect to turn up and fish for a day and have it all worked out and nail a bag of fish happens sometimes yeah odds are it's it's not going to happen every time though yeah no, that, i think that's exactly right i mean once again while you're talking i was thinking about i used to fish with my good mate stewie dunn and um, we fished together at home and we also fished against each other in in competitions now for the first couple of years, Stewie was, he just beat me every time, as simple as that. As time rolled on, we became much more even, like sometimes I'd win, sometimes he'd win. But in, in social fishing, he would beat me nine times out of 10. And you go, all right, well, what's going on there? Well, here's the thing. I would just go fish and throw the rods in the car and off a toddle. Stewie, he'd have new leaders, he'd have hooks. He'd, he's still he'd, in he'd, tournament mode. Yeah, he's prepared for a comp. Yeah. And so when he did that and I didn't, I couldn't compete with him. I mean, he, he's very talented too. So he's just a very good angler. Don't you hate people like that? Oh, kills you. <laughs> and there, look, there is people that just have, they just have something and you go, I yeah. don't know why. I can see what they're doing, but I can't replicate it. And that comes back to what we were talking about, sharing information. Someone can tell you to go and use, I don't know, a Daiwa two-inch grub with a one-six jig head. And that's what you're going to catch your fish on. But you're going to have to go and practice it. You're probably not just going to throw it out and catch a fish. You've got to go and, and practice and use it and get used to it. And look, you know, on those, on those days when the, the fishing's really tough and there's a couple of guys that are still on the podium, I guarantee they weren't all using the same lure either, you know. So just because a lure is working for somebody who has that lure dialed in, has a technique dialed in, doesn't mean that 
put that lure on your rod, you're going to start catching fish, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit more to it than that. That's it. Yeah. You, like we say, you've got to go and practice it. And, and it's interesting in reviewing the competitions, the amount of times the guys in the top three were doing three different things at three different parts of the system is, is just amazing. You go, someone will go, they're definitely in the deep. So if he catches his fish in the deep and someone goes, no, they're in the shallows and he gets them there. Like it's rare that they're just doing one thing in one part of the system. So Yeah. And look, we all, this may be, you know, to some extent maybe su- explains why you do have at times crushing results like you had and then donuts followed up. And that is that, yeah, we all have techniques that we, we favor, techniques that we're more comfortable with, we have more confidence in that we, we have the right skill set. And then we've got other techniques that we, we're trying to make them work, right? And we, we may be not getting quite the same results. But for somebody else, that's their go-to technique. Yeah, that's right? exactly. I think that's, that's kind of what happens sometimes, you know? And, and so the fish just happen to be somewhere different. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed, Deethi, but I don't reckon that fish actually listen to our podcast. They don't. <laughs> no. You know, they, they, they tend to make their own rules sometimes. Yep. And so if you happen to be in the right place and, and the technique that you're comfortable with is working, then you're going to have a great day, you know, and other, others might struggle. That's, yeah, that's right. I mean, for the Woi Woi comp, the predictions for the bite periods and stuff, so they have a rating on the day with the app that I use out of 100. Now, for this day, it was 96 out of 100. Yeah. So almost How'd perfect. How make you feel? Oh, well, I, <laughs> I must have been in that four. That was all I was thinking. <laughs> so, yeah. And look, I have a tip that, and I might have discussed this before, that I would have for any anglers that, that want to improve their game. And this is pick a lure. So oh, maybe a grub, a crank 38 or some sort of crankbait. doesn't matter what it is. Pick one lure, go and learn how to use that lure. Like don't take anything out for the day. Just keep casting that in different situations. Say it's a grub, rig it on a 1.6, go and fish the deep. Rig it on a, on a, a 128th or a 132 and fish it in the shallows. And go and learn that lure until you can fish it in 10 different situations and catch a fish and then put it down and go to the next one. And before long, you're going to have this massive arsenal of tips and, and ways that you can catch brim or flathead, or it doesn't really matter what species you're talking about, but just go and practice one thing. And it can be like, if I was going to advise anyone, go and start with a grub. It doesn't matter what, what brand you want to use, whether it's a Daiwa or a Z-Man or an Atomic, just pick it and go and learn how to use it in 10 different situations. And I, I don't think you'll look back. I think it's a, a great way to start. Yeah, I, I look, I agree. And I think you know, it's really easy. It doesn't again, doesn't matter what species you're targeting. There's so many different lures out there now, and there's you know, there's definitely some that they're kind of almost specialist lures, right? They're they're going to work when the conditions are just so, when the fish are doing something in particular. But there's a whole bunch of lures out there, like the you know, the two inch grub in a, in the southern estuary. You can't go past them. They're so versatile. You can fish them on the top. You can fish them on the bottom. The deep, the shallow, in the current. You know, lots of different species. And so if you pick one or two of those versatile lures and you really learn how to use it, and I did enjoy listening to one of your recent podcast interviews where you talked about exactly that, just getting to know one lure really well. You spend a lot less time going through your box trying to figure out what's going on. You spend a lot less time re-rigging. Yeah. And you spend a lot more time just working that lure and, and putting it in front of fish. Yeah. No, no, I think I think it's such a good way to go. I mean, just I've got two examples of that of guys that have zoned in on one lure. Yeah. So um, Stuart Walker, he uh, was a, a angler that fished in the ABT comps. I think you, you know Stuart and fish with Z-Man grubs. And he dominated from the back of the boat. He won a bunch of competitions just using a two-man Z, Z-Man grub. And to the point where I think he spoke about this, he would actually get two different colors of the grubs and put them in the bag together so the colors would bleed. So he kind of made his own color. <laughs> And that was, that was his thing. And then another example was Grant Kime, another boat fisherman who won the Australian Championships. So for ABT, won a boat and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to come to you Fishing. eventually. Quick Google it. All right. So um, yeah, so Grant Kime, so he fished these green plastic, I think they were smash baits, on all sorts of different jig heads and what have you. So apparently, like I, wasn't, I didn't go out in the boat with him, but he would have six rods rigged up with the same lure. And he was so proficient at it that he, that he won a grand final. So same deal, just one lure. And, and these guys were so into these lures that back in the day, they were buying 100 packets of them at a time. Yeah. They're, they're out of production <laughs> now. So, so there you go. Yeah. So, mate, I'm glad you mentioned that. But I'm going to bring this home now. But the, the last thing I want to do is just get one tip, one pearl of wisdom from you, right? So how long have you been fishing tournaments, mate? 
Since 2010, so about 13 years, excluding the COVID period. So, What's something that you would do routinely now in a tournament or, or not, or sort of recreational social fishing that you probably didn't do before you started tournament fishing? What's something that is now just kind of, this is just your, your second nature now? Oh, okay. I had to think about that for a while, for a second. But look, honestly, it's, I don't give up. I, never, I, I do not give up to the end of the comp. I know we mentioned that before, but it's absolutely key. Like you fish a comp or a, pre, a social fish, it doesn't matter. It only takes one good bite or two good bites or three or 10 good bites. It's only three casts in a, in a kayak comp. So you can do that in 10 minutes. So if I've got, I'm going to keep fishing. And look, an example of that, that wasn't me, but Chris Hickson, he just fished a comp and he talked about fishing the last 10 minutes of the comp and upgrading his bag. And in doing that, he, he moved into third place where he would have been fourth or fifth. And this is the last 10 minutes of a three-day comp. So yeah, yep. yeah yep. never give up. So let me ask you this. As you're paddling back at the end of the comp, you're heading back to the ramp. Are you dragging a lure behind the kayak? <laughs> Absolutely not. You get DQ'd for that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say yes to that. <laughs> I'm showing my tournament ignorance here. But <laughs> no, well, look, but I might have one last shot on the way through. And I have done this before. I have actually cast in front of me on the way back in a foster comp. I was doing it and I was only had two fish and I pulled a fish by, by casting in front as I was pedaling full steam. Cast out basically on a brim's nose and and caught a fish and bagged out. So that comes back to the never give up thing. Yeah. So great piece of advice. And if you're heading somewhere for a fishing holiday and you're happy to just go out in the water and have some nice time with your family, that's great. If it's a serious fishing holiday, you're going to be fishing all the way back to the ramp at the end of that holiday ride until you put the bait on the yeah, trailer. Absolutely. You're not going to give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. There's still fish there. And, and you know, sometimes boat ramps are the best they, places. They too. often are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome stuff. And I, I can tell you a story about that, in fact, from my own experience just recently. I think I might have mentioned this to you a little while back, uh, mangrove jack fishing here in Trinity Inlet, where I'd gone right up into a creek system, fished for hours, perfect tides, didn't get a fish, missed a couple, you know, came back to the ramp and there's a big long line of boats waiting to, waiting to get out. And I thought, oh, I'll just have a couple of flicks here on the opposite side of the river to the, to the ramp. And yeah, seven jacks in, in the space of about you know, 25 minutes Yeah, in, in the most public, accessible, easy to find place that you could imagine. So never give up. Never give up. And <laughs> that story is repeated in different forms quite often. Quite often. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Hey, Deethy, it has been fantastic talking to you. Tons of great information. Thoroughly enjoyed the chat. We should do this more often, actually. We should just sit down on a Friday evening, turn on the microphones and have a bit of a chat because I think it's been a lot of fun and, and I hope. Lots of good information shared that will help our listeners as well. So thank you once again and look forward to your next episode on The Brim Project. Also look forward to your next episode on uh, ALF Podcast, of course. Absolutely. And I look forward to talking to you and, and doing those interviews as well. So thanks again. Mate. All right. Have a great weekend. All right. Cheers, mate. Thanks for listening to the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast. For free show notes, downloads, tools and resources, please visit our website on doclures.com or consider supporting the show by joining Team Doc Lures to receive exclusive members-only episodes, tools and resources. But for now, tight lines and may the fish be with you. 